Yes, it is spring, and no, it's not too early for gardening. Seedlings are sprouting, garden plans are in the works, and we have some great ideas for container gardening coming up on this edition of Great Gardening. We celebrate each year um, as we receive it. For good nutrition, we need a balance of colors. I like to can because I'm a gardener. We brought home an orchard for our community. This was just an overgrown area full of bramble. Hello and welcome back for our 12th regular season of Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish, along with our experts, Tom Casper, the president of the Duluth Garden Flower Society. Welcome back. Nice to be here. And Bob Olin, county educator and horticulturist and gentleman. The snow is melting, seeds have been potted, uh, indoors or in greenhouses, of course, but it's really time to get started on your gardening. Well, it's really amazing what a week makes. Mm -hmm. Last Thursday, the three of us were at the home show, yeah. and yes. it was blizzarding out, and people were lamenting, and here we are a week later, and spring is before us. And we have some seedlings here, um, Bob, that you brought in, and right. how, how long ago were these planted? These were planted about three weeks ago. These are peppers that grow a little bit slower mm -hmm. and people don't have to get too concerned because um, most places they haven't even started to seed uh, the tomatoes and uh, some of the main season crops. Okay. Peppers take a little longer, onions and so forth, but uh, we still have a little time. We're not going to rush the season too much. Okay, great. Well, also we want to welcome back our phone volunteers, the Master Gardeners from St. Louis County, who generously donate their time to staff our phones. So you can call in those questions you've been storing up all winter. The numbers are there on your screen, or you can email your questions in as well during the show to uh, askgardening at wdse.org. Well, this week's topic is creative containment, and we want to begin with some inspiration from a gardener in Hibbing who has put together some really interesting combinations. The interesting thing about this one is this is a host plant. So this is a cordine, and I'm very fond of putting other things in my pot, so I, I have put feathers in it. And this is a cactus. And I think with the purple pot, it looks pretty with the colors that are in the plants. That's ornamental kale and fountain grass, and then it's a sedum ground cover in the lime green, which is, and it's in an antique cement pot. This one is a combination of herbs and flowers. The herb is a fennel. Uh, instead of asparagus fern, I thought I would try that. And it doesn't grow any taller than what it is now. You've got some vinca in there, and you've also got the red flower is a polka dot flower. I've also got a succulent in there, uh, kind of a bluish green color, and then a yellow flower that's new to me. And it's in, in an antique wicker pot. This is lemon balm, which makes a great filler. This is called a fuzzy gla uh, grass, fuzzy grass. We also have a um, perennial plant and that can go right into this, this is a hookara, hookara, and that can go right into your garden when you no longer are using the pot. I usually take the flower off. It's a beautiful color. If you can see that, how oh, it matches so nice with the blue hosta. And then this is a um, sweet potato vine, cordine, and it comes in various colors. This is a red and a green one, and it, I think it's just a beautiful plant. This is called a polka dot plant, and it also comes in red and pink. I'm doing a succulent in that we have some moss roses here, which are really succulents. And then I also have a um, succulent rose plant, which brings out the pink and the green and the lime in it. And I've stuck a feather in its cap. Uh, that's called a cloche. If you've got something that needs support, you can use that or you can do your vining around it. Uh, that's filled with water and um, when I took the plant out of the plastic container, I just shook it a little bit, but basically I just plunked the whole thing 
into it and what needed to be weighted down there's a little bit of rock in there but I'm finding that any of the vincas or the vining things are really doing well and then in there also is a water lettuce and that's basically used in ponds this one has the kind of the basic um, super tunias or calabaca it's a metal planter so it can take quite a few. There's about six plants in there, but I think the baby tut is what really, really makes it, and the different colors that are in there. The combination is fountain grass, um, regular corn. We have some vinca, and I'm finding that these are either shade or, or part sun. It doesn't seem to make any difference. They're growing very well. My eyes always open for pots. And I like to put some height in it, but I also like to add different things. Uh, for example, over here, I added a sculpture to. That's Pan with his flute. I think that color combination is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you might not think to put that together, the orange and the pink, but it really works. Well, thanks again to Donna. She really had some unique and beautiful arrangements there. When you're putting things in a container, though, a couple things we need to consider about the soil and the moisture. Right. Um, and she, of course, had one container that was water, mm -hmm. and she was growing some plants. But most of them, we really want well-drained, uh, the opportunity to wick away that water. So. A good, good drainage, and you have to have a nutrient source from some place. Okay. And uh, so I, I think uh, drainage structure and then where you're going to get the nutrients from. And you put those three things together and you can grow in just about any kind of container, really. Is there a particular potting mix to use? There are a lot of them out there. Yeah. I, I think that um, you can even make your own. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of versatility there. But once again, good drainage. And then you, you really have to have a nutrient source. Most of the containerized mixes will actually have some slow-release uh, fertilizers in there, right. may have some nutrient balance, maybe a little lime in there. You can do something very similar, but you are going to have to supply nutrients to most of these mixes. So that'll be one of the water-soluble fertilizers as you go through the growing season. Yeah. And you, right. you really want to make sure if you're making or mixing your own that it's a nice light soil. Often you'll see where people will take soil right out of their garden and put it in their containers, and that just really doesn't work. It's just okay. too heavy. So. Well, another type of container that's gaining a lot of notice is the straw bale, as you guys well know. Planting a small garden inside a bale of straw does have its advantages. Yeah, we had some fun with this uh, last year when it kind of took off. And uh, it's a container in the sense that you've actually got the media on the inside, so you'll be conditioning these bales so they actually starts to compost. You're adding nutrient, and then the outside shell tends to be kind of firm. It can save space. I really think that the biggest advantage, or one of them, is that you can grow this any place. If you've got a driveway, a patio, if you've got uh, our wonderful, what people call lakeside loam, the real heavy clays that are difficult to work in, or maybe even ledge rock. So you can put them there, you can put them out in the full sun, 68 hours worth of sun. So I think they're really has some advantages that way. Yeah, and uh, some things you have to consider though, uh, where you put it, because it, it needs yeah, for a certain amount of sun. You need good sun, 60, 68 hours of full sun. You have to be very careful. I mentioned this conditioning. Straw itself is basically just a carbon cellulose fiber. You're going to have to get that to break down. So there's going to have to be either a synthetic fertilizer or there's going to have to be a uh, some kind of organic fertilizer, but that's going to take time. It takes 14 in our area, 14 to 28 days to properly condition mm -hmm. these bales. Fun for people to try. We'll hear more about that, I'm sure, as the season goes on. Yeah, we're going to evaluate last year's success, and maybe we can report what that, uh, that evaluation looks like okay. and report some of those figures to you. Good. Well, the phones are ringing. Questions to answer uh, coming in from our viewers tonight. But last weekend, as you mentioned, Tom, we were at the Arrowhead Home and Builders Show. We were there from Wednesday through Sunday. Tom and Bob were there Thursday night. Tom, uh, you were there for a lot of the weekend. Yep. and. Great people there. Um, we had master, master gardener volunteers answering questions there, but also we brought some questions back. So let's right. take a look at one of them and get an answer from you guys. I'm wondering how to save the seeds from the Gerbera daisy. Is there a male and a female seed and how do you do it? <laughs> Go ahead. I like that sound. Uh, good question. And, and really, they're pretty easy to save. Mm -hmm. uh, you collect them in the fall as they're maturing. 
you want to do some uh, cold treatment to them in your refrigerator for over the winter. They need some amount of cold uh, exposure or cool exposure, not in the freezer, but rather the fridge. And then in the spring, you can uh, start germinating. They're a long germination, though, so people would have already wanted to start those if they wanted them for this summer. So. And right. also an answer to the question, no male and female. By the time you get to the seed, that combination has already occurred. It's already been fixed. <laughs> That's right. Good. Here's another question for you. Well, I use seed tape for my radishes, and I put the seed tape in the soil, and I, put, I covered it as I was told. And then interestingly, sections of that seed tape would come up with radishes and other sections would produce nothing. So how could this be, assuming all the seeds were put in the seed tape at the same time? It's an interesting question. Now he said again that just sections were germinating. If in fact it was an occasional seed here or occasional seed there, I would suspect that the, the seed itself may not have 100% germination. None of them really do. But sections would mean there's probably going to be something different in the soil. I would think uh, moisture levels and continuity of moisture. To get the seeds to germinate properly, they have to be moistened, and then you need a certain amount of continuous moisture so they don't dry down. So I would rather suspect that uh, it has to do with the exact texture and moisture holding capacity of these dif different portions of the soil. And, All right. And usually Bob and I agree. But um, not this time. No, we'll agree again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was waiting for a better explanation for that than that one. I thought We're it was perfect. Here. All right, on to the next question. I want to know how to transplant mature Concord grapes. They've been in for about 15 years. I want to pull them all up and move them about 60 miles south. It, it was actually kind of fun talking to him and his wife at the home show. I mm -hmm. remember speaking to them after they had recorded this. And, yeah. and he's a, recently got involved in growing grapes and they were making wine and all mm -hmm. sorts of things that he was experimenting with. But really it's pretty easy. Grapes are pretty resilient. He'll want to dig those up uh, as soon as the soil is pliable here after the frost is out. Uh, get as much of the root system as he can, cut down the cane to two or three feet, and uh, then he can very easily move it, get it watered in very well, and it should be fine. All right. And Tom, do you think another thing he should do is when he gets those roots up, don't get them dried down so heavy. There's some damp sphagnum peat moss or some other material to hold the moisture, and then yep. he can move them. And yeah, get them in the yeah, get them moved as quick as he can. So. All right. One more question, this one about planting uh, from one location to another. I would like to take a cutting and start a new tree. So I would like to know how to do that. It's a cherry tree that my mother started from a pit and I planted it in 1995. You know, I'd like to know how to do that too, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little tricky, that, that particular process. She's taking a vegetative cutting from a woody and um, we should really do that probably a little bit earlier in the season. March would be a good time, but if she doesn't have that as an option, I'd do it right now. And you're going to take these cuttings, and you're going to take plenty of them because not many of them will root. You're going to have to stick them in a damp sand, and then you're going to have to cover that with some kind of a poly so it doesn't dry down because all the moisture is going to have to wick up into that twig until you can develop some root system. A little bit tricky. Uh, you got to got to keep that top stock, that cyan moist, so spritz it underneath that, uh, that plastic covering can be done, but she might get one out of 20 cuttings it actually takes and roots for her. And, and keep it out of the direct sun while she's running Yeah, you can burn it, it pretty yeah. badly if it's in the direct sun, yeah. so keep All it right. cool. Well, we hope Gladys has luck with that because uh, we've seen that tree and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It yeah. is. Just a couple more questions before we move on. These came in on the phone tonight, um, and one was what, what type of plants grow well in a straw bale? Are there particular ones? You know, you can grow just about anything really in a straw bale that you can grow in your garden. Uh, a little trickier if you're going to direct seed, you want to use some potting soil on the top of the bale, but anything that you can transplant, uh, you basically can grow in a straw bale. And, and we've seen some of those pictures over time where people are growing potatoes and tomatoes and peppers and coleus and petunias, all sorts of different yeah. things on them. So. This is another thing in the survey of people that are straw baling. We're going to ask if they have a preference or if they've had better success with one crop versus another. We had somebody at the home show who came from Cloquet and said they had great success with Roma tomatoes in their straw bales. So just passing that along. Yay, Cloquet. <laughs> <laughs> Marion in Duluth wants to know, when can I take the bag leaves off that are covering my perennials? 
Um, we're probably not there yet. What I suggest doing and what I personally do is I'm going to peek under them every couple of days, lift up the bags if, if the snow is off of it. We're still a little early. We still can get some of these cold temperatures. So they're right now sort of helping slow that down a little bit. We don't want to see a lot of growth yet on some of those tender perennials. So hold off another week or so and she should be good. You know, Tom, what you'll find is the same thing is true of taking strawberry, straw off your strawberries or off your garlic. Uh, yeah, hold them back as much as you can. I hate to say it, we may still have some winter left or cooler don't temperatures. Don't, I say, won't say, don't say the S word. But, <laughs> yeah, we won't. but if they are starting to move through the ground, uh, you really want to get them off because those growing, growing tips can become deformed and the plant struggles in, yep. in uh, retaining a, a regular form. So if they're starting to come up, you'll have to take them off. If it gets cold, you might have to put them back on. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take more questions from our viewers coming up a little bit later. But this week's tour takes us to a fairly small yard in Duluth, but it is literally packed to the gills. My name is Kathy Bomey. I live here in Duluth on Glenwood Street, and welcome to my garden. A lot of little shrubs have just kind of uh, found their way here. I like contrast and color, so that's why I have the chartreuse and the deeper colors. Summer glow tamarisk. Um, you know, that is a very small tree. It's about 12 to 15 years old. And, um, it's just a kind of a point of interest. I bought this house in May of 1985, and I started in May of 1985. So there was not a garden here, and I had no intention in filling the whole yard in. But it just came to being as wanting plants and acquiring things from friends, splitting my own things, and uh, I, I don't like to mow, so what you see, what we're standing on is pretty much it. I found a lot of flat rocks, a lot of rocks in my travels of backpacking, and set them in place, and then I have uh, Irish moss, Scotch moss, regular moss, and then this elfin creeping thyme that just just travels along the spaces. I, once in a while I'll take a little piece and stick it in, but it usually just goes on its own and it, you can walk on it. It's pretty. And then of course the two hybrid tea, uh, tea roses. Um, I can't do the Minnesota tip method here as obviously because there's no space, so I literally dig them up and bury them in my uh, vegetable garden. Tamarack in front of me. It's a regular old swamp tamarack pulled out of the swamp up in Chisholm, and uh, it's one of my one of my favorite trees in the yard. Plus my weeping my larger tamarack, of course hosta. I think it's one of my one of my favorite plants, and the pansy is one of my favorite flowers. I always have pansies somewhere. They're they're cute. They're uh, kind of very low maintenance. I have. To, so I had hardly even water it because the stuff that's in there, the plants that are in there are in the sedum family. There's absolutely whatsoever no plant in this garden. I took the master gardener course and it was very interesting because I was, I had a lot of this done. This is one of the best investments I have ever spent in gardening. I, it's relaxing, you know, the sound of the water is beautiful, it draws in the neighbors and the people walking up and down. So water plants are, are very pretty, very interesting, but an actual living pond or living garden with the, with the plants is so pleasing, so relaxing. Thanks again to Kathy. Uh, that was a beautiful tour. We, we love being there. We're going to check back with her later. But right now, questions are coming in fast and furious. Another one about straw bales. It, actually, it's a comment, and I just want to share it. It's from Terry in Two Harbors who said, after he was done with the straw bale for the season, it broke open. He threw some pumpkin seeds on it, and it had his best pumpkins ever. 
Great. <laughs> nice. I think that's well interesting. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. You know, we had a question out of uh, Virginia, if I can find it here, about how do I start a community garden? And also, can I use old mining tires for a garden? That's Wanda in Virginia. Well, the, the, the Duluth Community Garden Program that we have featured uh, uh, several times on the show over the years, and Bob was instrumental in the creation of more than two decades ago. <laughs> We when he was in people. his teens. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just a baby gardener. They're, they're a great resource for other communities that want to do something that is successful like uh, the Duluth Community Garden Program is. So I would contact them if they're looking to do something and sure. get some ideas from And what them. about those uh, old mining tires? They'll work. Okay. You can use them, sure. And okay. uh, they, I don't think you really have to worry about a lot of residue. Always um, edibles toward the center of any kind of a, an artificial product like that carrots and so forth and and your other crops can go around the outside. Great. Dennis from Eveleth wants to know can you grow blueberries in a container and if so do you have to put the bush in the ground during the winter? Oh he's got it. Uh, the, the problem with blueberries is the roots are going to be hardy but only if they're down on the ground. So if he's, you can grow them in the containers they're not a real aggressive root system but you're really going to have to protect them and submerging that container in the ground is a good idea. But it's going to have to be a fairly substantial container. Okay. All right, uh, Luann from Ashland, we got this one at the home show, wanted to know when I prune my snowball viburnum, when do I prune my mock orange blizzard? Well, both of our spring bloomers, mm -hmm. uh, so she'll want to wait till after they bloom. Unless she doesn't care about the bloom or if there's snow damage, uh, she can go in now and start cleaning those up and getting the, the broken canes or the broken uh, branches out and then they'll be fine. So. Okay. And both prune up pretty well, really. Yep. Mm -hmm. Shirley in Fayle Township wants to know where do I get a large amount of soil for a vegetable garden and what product is best? Boy, you know, that's a real challenging question. I know the part of the county she's in. There are quote-unquote soil, or they like to call themselves dirt suppliers, and you really have to ask the intelligent questions. You're looking for a sandy loam mineral soil, maybe amended with a peat. So you just keep asking, ask for soil tests. Uh, you're looking for that sandy loam, and you can find some suppliers that do have it available. Okay, one, one more quick one. How much uh, longer can Judy prune an oak tree, or is it too late? Judy in Duluth, can she still prune an oak tree? Uh, Should she prune an oak tree? You know, I, w I would probably stay away entirely until we come into the fall because okay. of the risk of uh, oak wilt. So uh -huh. let's just stay away from the oaks at this point, and uh, let's wait until we get uh, well into maybe yeah. September. September, October is perfect, through uh, probably December, January kind of thing. All right, we'll see if late. we can squeeze in a few more questions a little bit later, but we want to tell you that that tour we just took to Kathy Bowman's yard, well, you didn't see everything. She is a master of making use of her space, and here's another great example of creative containment. Three years ago, I started with a sandbox with potatoes. Last year, I started doing um, in sandboxes and swimming pools, more things. I did Swiss chard. This is the first year I've done beans in a little boy stock tank. And this is the first year I've done carrots. Cucumbers I put in a pot behind and then trellis them up so they go up. So I don't even use the air, waste the air space. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that are doing it now. I like it because, first of all, it's off the ground, so you don't get the slugs. Uh, it's a little higher, so you don't get the rabbits. It's a buffet for the deer, so I use the deer netting. And I do use um, some fertilizer. I have a vermicomposter in my basement. That's a, a worm composter, and I use the worm juice. I, I, I really like it. And then when it's cold, they're on pallets with casters. I just wheel it in the garage so I extend my season on both ends. I can plant earlier or I can keep them going later and move them in and out. And you get a lot to eat out of this. I get a lot to eat. All right. Well, yeah, that that goes right to our question here from Barb and Kenwood. She wanted to know what are good vegetables for containers, and those mm. are some great examples. Also, uh, Barb in Duluth wants to know what are your favorite annuals for pots up here in the Northland? Do you guys have favorites you want to name, one or two? Uh, well, certainly the calibricoas uh, mm -hmm. are very outstanding. They'll bloom all season long for you if you keep them fertilized. Those are a favorite of mine. So, okay. And of course in containers, the, all of the wonderful hanging petunias, super petunias, razzle dazzle, the wave series, there are so many glorious petunias that do sure. well, so well in pots. 
Okay. Well, you know, we also, before we want to go, we've got a, a couple minutes left, we want to show you some of the really inventive ways that gardeners reuse, recycle, and display. So here's just a few examples of those. Um, first, we're going to see a, a pail and a ringer, and that's a great way to use that. And then, of course, the old washing machine. We've seen that one before. It works really well. This I hadn't seen before, a file cabinet, and uh, nice Karen got that at a show in Chicago, at the flower show in Chicago. She brought back a picture. Many people use a chair, a teapot, mm -hmm. of course, is reusable. Take a look at that toaster. That's, that's a, fun. That's, that's an fun. old classic, isn't it? Carlene Blair from International Falls sent that in. And, you know, people use five-gallon buckets for sure. vegetables a lot, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure you got some drainage at the bottom. That's, a, that's actually a pretty good container. Okay. And then here are some more things from, from Carlene. And uh, she likes to use the old ice cube tray and the old measuring cups and really a, a creative way to fill up your containers and make a a cute arrangement. Absolutely. Well, and it, and it really harkens to that there's really no wrong way as long as you're following some of the principles or wrong things to use. They're all interesting and fun and and remind us of like the old washing machine that some of us are old enough to remember having seen one of those in use. Um, but all kinds of fun things that you can do. Okay. And then a couple of reminders. The annual Spring Garden Extravaganza is coming up. and. Uh, you guys are going to be involved in that. It's really an important topic this year. It's on Saturday at Hermantown High School. High School. Right. Okay, uh, tell me just a little bit more about it. Yeah, we're taking a look at the pollinators, and Tom's going to work with us on this. And uh, the types of materials that you can plant modify your lawn and landscape, your fruits and vegetables, so that you can actually improve the habitat for bees and honeybirds. Or <laughs> honeybirds. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> like that one. Uh, You're cutting words off. Yeah, birds, bees, <laughs> and butterflies. And uh, it's going to be a fun day with lots okay, of great, great speakers. Okay, great. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be there myself. Uh, for more details on that and also how, how you can get tickets to our annual garden bus tour, we've got one in June, one in July. Please go to our website, wdse.org slash gardening. Well, that went fast. Thanks again to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners, our garden experts, Bob and Tom, and all of you optimistic gardeners watching and those who called in. Happy gardening.